information included on there, but I don't intend to go in depth on every part of that. I thought what I would focus on is just mainly <clears throat> what the basic components of an assessment are and especially what some of the tests measure. And I'm certainly willing to answer your questions as we go or at the end either way. So I uh, guess I'll go ahead and get started. I, I'm a licensed psychologist and I've worked here about 30 years and I do uh, primarily testing. We see, of course, we test all the new enrollees. We usually do that to give the teachers information about their skills and their abilities. But then we also provide outside diagnostic services too. And we see people from ages, you know, four all the way up to adults for a variety of reasons. But usually it's related to learning or attention problems, some kind of learning or language difficulty. So. I'll go ahead and start, and as I say, as we're going, it's okay if you want to ask questions. And um, so I'll just go ahead and start by, uh, you've probably heard the term assessment, and you've probably heard testing, but really, an assessment is more than just testing. Testing is just probably the main component of an assessment, but an assessment is really collecting a lot of information, you know, to determine where a child's strengths are and weaknesses and of course what kind of interventions they might need and it usually includes testing in these areas um, intelligence and information processing and keep in mind that intelligence and ability testing it kind of overlaps with information processing it's usually uh, what I'm saying is that a lot of the subtests on a lot of the parts of an IQ test also measure information processing like memory and speed of processing, and of course also how well you can just express information because you have to answer questions on IQ tests as well. And then the other uh, major component is academic skills, and that's of course reading and math and written language. And then attention, and attention is usually assessed by, certainly the most important thing is like, is by interviewing the parents and getting a history of how things have played out, and then using questionnaires and rating scales from the teachers and the parents, and if the kid is old enough, having him do, him or her do rating scales. And then also, you know, there are some uh, computer tests that m supposedly measure attention, and they're usually computer-based tests that require a student to sit down and stick with something and not be impulsive, and they measure how quickly you're responding, whether or not your attention waxes and wanes, uh, whether you just stop responding because you space out. So those, those tests have some validity, but I found that as the years have gone by and kids are more and more involved with computers, it seems like even though that test is really, usually those tests are intentionally boring, a lot of kids can still do them just because it's on a computer. So. You can have a kid who's totally, you know, totally hyper or, you know, inattentive all the time in class and at home, and yet they can sit down and do this boring test just because, well, I've never done this test before, so, so they can often get through it and the test results look fine, and yet the results probably don't mean very much. That happens a lot. We use it though, you know, especially for older kids, just to see if they can stick with it. Uh, and now you also look at emotional and social and behavioral functioning and of course that's done partly by interviewing the parents and asking them questions about those areas but also rating scales pick up on now those areas of functioning as well and how many of you have ever had to fill out rating scales on someone or you've just had to okay so you can see that you can probably kind of pick up on the patterns. Some of the questions are kind of repetitive, but maybe worded differently. But most rating scales, after they've been filled out, then when you score them, they fit, the questions fit into categories, like you know, aggression, uh, rule-breaking behavior, inattention, uh, depression, anxiety, and then the scores tell you whether those areas are elevated in a way that's really out of the norm for um, compared to how kids usually respond. So that's how they're used. So those, that's what rating scales do is they put behaviors into categories and they tell you the, the magnitude of the 
or the severity of the behavior. And I know you've, you've you know, you're, I'm sure you're aware that there's different types of assessments and, you know, there's neuropsych evaluations and I guess some of the things we do kind of overlap, but I'm not a trained neuropsychologist, but a neuropsychology usually involves <coughs> brain behavior relationships based on the test results that tells you how that part of their brain functions or some uh, process in the brain is how well it's operating. And psychological evaluation focuses more on, you know, just you have areas of language understanding and visual spatial uh, processing and visual discrimination. Uh, I don't try to, whenever I um, assess someone, I don't try to relate it to a specific part of the brain, but I do say, you know, these are memory problems and therefore here's how they should be addressed. So you may get more, a little bit more, on a neuropsych exam you may get more explanation of, of what's going on neurologically. And then a psychoed evaluation is a combination of, you know, psychology and the academic piece, reading and math <coughs> and math, and that's basically what we do here. It's, uh, part psychology, part educational. And then you have public school assessment, which really is partly uh, a psychoeducational assessment, except the goals are usually different. The goal is to determine uh, placement or eligibility for special ed. So the approach to the assessment is, is often a little different. Uh, because if a kid is not eligible for services, that may often be the end of the assessment. It's not like they say, here are 25 recommendations to consider based on the assessment, it's like you don't qualify or you do qualify. That's not to say that public schools might not, they might make suggestions, but it's not. Usually the assessment kind of ends there after they've, if a student has been found not only eligible. And you know, there's another, there's another type of assessment that I didn't mention, and that's uh, reading. I, I know there's reading specialists who do assessments now, and really they're, I've read some, and they're really pretty good. I mean, they often, they've been trained in reading and they often focus on, um, you know, they usually have a teaching degree or they have a degree in reading. And they, uh, I see some of the things that they give and they're really good for identifying dyslexia. And so a lot of people, whenever they hear that term dyslexia, they think of, you know, that's a medical diagnosis. And I know parents will go to the schools and ask them if they will, can you uh, diagnose or can you see if my child has dyslexia? And sometimes, often the public school will say, no, that's a medical, have you heard this before, that it's a medical diagnosis? Or, and really it's not. It's a, it's a clinical diagnosis or even an educational diagnosis because the instruments you use, um, we'll talk about the instruments you use, but part of it is just administering reading instruments but then also looking at phonological processing, phonological awareness, auditory memory, auditory sequencing, and those tasks can be given by, those kinds of tests can be given by a reading specialist. So I think, I've seen some reading specialists who just do assessments. Is anyone here a reading specialist? Just exclusively, or? Do you do assessments, or? I just do basic ones, yeah. I don't think I'm doing that. I work from a survey. Yeah. Okay. All right. So those are the different types of assessments, and oops, and you know, usually a good assessment should be conducted by a qualified professional, and usually is. Now, some of this relates all to um, also to adults or students going off to um, college. They often want to see. The assessment has to be current, uh, has to be comprehensive so that you can come up with a diagnosis and uh, usually it includes relevant historical information and that's usually collected either by you know, the interview with a parent or uh, report cards, previous test results, <coughs> relevant medical records. So that's all part of the assessment. The assessment is all this collecting of data. And Whereas the testing is just one component. And it's also, especially if you're going off to college, uh, the history of accommodations used in the past is 
good information to have as well. I mean, they've had a